Well, good afternoon. Oh, let me just uh, make sure I'm visible. Good afternoon and welcome to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center of Nassau County's Curator, uh, sorry, Sunday with Survivors program with Holocaust survivor Renee Silver. My name is Thorin Tritter. I am the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. Uh, before we get to our program this afternoon, I wanted to let you know that we are, as I said, recording the program. So uh, if you don't want to be included, simply just turn off your camera. I also want to let you know about some upcoming programs. So there's a few of them. Uh, this coming Thursday, February 17th, we'll be hosting a program with historian Michael Nyberg, who's going to draw from his recent book, When France Fell, as he shares information about the rise of Vichy France and how the Nazi takeover of France changed American thinking about the conflict in Europe. That's it's really a fabulous book that, um, uh, that highlights how America struggled to deal with the Vichy government and its collaboration with the Germans. I will be back for my next Curator's Corner on February 23rd with another program in honor of Black History Month. I'm going to be talking about several images in our gallery of African-American liberators. So I hope you'll be interested in joining us for that. And then one more program to mention on Thursday, February 24th, we will be joined by author and scholar Beverly Eddy, who will be talking about alien soldiers at Camp Ritchie and how a group of immigrants and refugee soldiers helped to, the allies to win World War II. So I hope that those will be of interest to, to you. You can find information about these programs and all of our upcoming schedule on our website at www.hmtcli.org and then click on the events tab. Okay, so with those announcements taken care of, let me shift to this afternoon's program. And for that, I would like to introduce the man behind our Sunday with Survivors programs, and that is Mr. Michael Mantell. Michael is a 3G, two of his grandparents are survivors and they instilled in him the need to not let this history and the larger history of the Holocaust be forgotten. More than a year ago, Michael contacted the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center to try and arrange a survivor to speak for a group of his family members. And after that program, we had some further conversations and realized this wasn't something that we should limit to just his family, but to make as a public program. And our Sunday with Survivor series was launched. We've also since then launched our 2G Tuesday program to provide a forum for the children of Holocaust survivors to share their family stories. Anyway, I'm grateful for Michael and his entire family for their continued support and interest in this. And I turn it over to you, Michael, to lead us in. Thank you so much, Thorin, as always. Thank you to you and the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center and everyone there for putting together these incredible programs like Sundays with Survivors and 2G Tuesdays and for making them the success that they are. Thank you to everyone here today uh, and for those viewing this recording. Um, I definitely did not expect such an amazing turnout with the Olympics and the Super Bowl. So thank you all for proving me wrong. It's so wonderful to see new faces and familiar faces. So this means a lot to me and, and to all of us. Um, and I wanna give a special thank you to all of the survivors, uh, especially Renee Silver, who will be speaking with us today. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to, today, to today's Sundays with Survivors. And as Thorne said, Sundays with Survivors is an online platform that allows Holocaust survivors to share their stories with people all over the world. And for that, I am internally grateful for this technology and for all of you being here today. Um, so why are these programs and organizations like the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center so important. A new survey of North American teens conducted by Liberation 75 found that a third of Canadian and American students think the Holocaust was fabricated or question whether the Holocaust actually happened. This is a time when we still have survivors with us. And 40% of students said that they learned about the Holocaust from social media. 
So we need to tap into that. And we're doing that today by using technology. So I'm hoping that we can share the recording of this event with all the people we know, including young people and students. There is something hopeful in that survey. 92% of the students inter, uh, um, survey said they wanted to learn more about the Holocaust. So that is hopeful. Uh, before I turn this over to Renee, I'd like to ask you all to save the date for our next 2G Tuesdays program, uh, which will be on Tuesday, March 8th. And also, if anyone has any questions or comments, I ask you to please think about it during the program. To make this meaning, meaningful event even more special, at the end of today's program, we will be having a Q&A portion. So we encourage you all to ask your questions at that point. If you don't feel like you want to ask them, you can write them in the comments and Thorne and I can ask it for you. But um, we really hope as many people as possible will take part in that as well. Uh, with that, again, I want to thank everyone for being here. And I'd like to turn the floor over to Renee. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's not easy competing with Super Bowl, but I will try. Uh, this image here is taken just before the war started, actually. Uh, I am, it's an image of my little sister Edith and myself uh, wearing as usual matching outfits. This one here happened to have been knitted by my mother. Here is another image taken around the same period, a little bit closer to the beginning of the war, actually, in dresses that were made for us by a seamstress. Uh, those are the only clothes we wore. They were either made for us by a grandmother, a mother, or by a private seamstress. So it, it was a good time. Uh, we were comfortable. I was born almost 91 years ago in a place that no longer exists called the Saarland. I was born in the capital of the Saarland, uh, which is uh, Saarbrücken. Uh, it's a, an area which was after the Treaty of Versailles uh, in, 19, in June of 1919, was declared an independent territory, although it had been a very, very desirable part of Germany until World War I. It, was, it has many, many uh, very rich coal basins uh, which feed the steel mills on both sides of, of the Rhine River in, in France, as well as in Germany. Uh, before I go any further to describe my early existence in uh, Saarbrücken, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about France itself, why France is every other European's favorite country. It is simply a beautiful country. It is a rich country. One of the reasons for its richness is its many, many rivers you can see, um, which connect uh, uh, people you know, to the ocean. And, the, and then there are canals that connect the various rivers to one another. The rivers are, are all navigable, except for the Loire. So the Loire was used for other purposes to build the French king's chateaux, Chambord, Chenonceau, Azé le Rideau, Blois, uh, Chinon, all of these are on the Loire River. It also has, you know, of course, the Alps, uh, separating it from Switzerland and Italy, and the Pyrenees separated the, France from um, Spain. Uh, as you can see, it has a coastline along the North Sea, the, uh, the uh, English Channel, which the French call La Manche, meaning a sleeve, uh, which is really a part of the Atlantic Ocean, and of course the Mediterranean. So uh, it also has a history that is rich in literature, in different peoples having come to France. It is a phenomenal country. And despite having experienced a great deal of hardship in France, I still love the country. So here I am born in 19, 
31 in the Saarland. And I should have been from earliest childhood on aware of uh, what a war is like or what a war means because my father was paralyzed on his entire left side. His left leg and his left arm were useless uh, as the result of a triple injury to the brain in, while in the trenches in the Verdun front fighting in 1914-15 for the Kaiser. He was German. He had the Hanover, he was given the Hanover Cross for um, your courage, et cetera. Um, he was declared 90% damaged and was getting a pension from the German government. But uh, he, he had you know, established a successful business in the Saarland, a scrap metal business, which again fed the steel mills on both sides of the Saar River a small river that goes into the Moselle, which eventually goes into the Rhine, and uh, which you know, fed both the steel mills in France on the, on the Western side and the steel mills in Germany. The arrangements for this independence of the Saarland were that while the Saarland was totally independent in the sense that my parents had to have passports allowing them to visit either France or Germany, uh, the Saar had its own postal stamp system and uh, you know, was independent, but in 1935, it was, it, you know, there was to be a plebiscite, a vote by the, uh, the Saarlanders, as they were called, to determine whether they wanted to remain independent, uh, become German or become French. This whole thing had been uh, decided at the Treaty of Versailles and was being supervised by uh, the uh, Geneva Treaty. In 1935, this plebiscite took place. In 1933, Hitler had taken on supreme power in Germany. Just before the plebiscite, a maid, and as I said, we were comfortable. A maid on her day off took me to a parade unbeknownst to my parents. And uh, here I was put on the shoulders of a very tall soldier, an SS man. And I saw these, what I thought were beautiful red flags with a black cross in the middle fluttering everywhere. And the crowd was very excited. And then an open car came by with a man having stretched out his arm and the crowd went wild. And I, four years old, thought it was formidable. When we got home in the late afternoon, uh, there were similar flags fluttering from the windowsills of uh, many of our neighbors, and they had these fat candles burning on the windowsill as well. Of course, none of this happened to my parents. They were very angry with the maid who was fired a few days afterwards. Within days of this plebiscite and of this visit, uh, my little neighbors, few sto uh, st stories above me, were no longer allowed to play with me and I no longer played to play with them. And their father appeared in a brown uniform. Uh, my father decided immediately, he was very tuned in to what was happening, that we would uh, take up the opportunity to move to France since that was made, that opportunity was made available to us. Uh, we moved to France, but we were not allowed to move to where my father was establishing a new business, which was a town called Sargemin, also named for the Saar River, Sarge, Saarbrücken in, in the Saarland and Sargemin in Lorraine, France. Uh, he established this uh, business there, but we weren't, for some reason, the French would not allow us to immediately move to this border town. So the first year we lived in a tiny Alsatian village actually called the Diemeringen. And uh, within you know, no time at all, 
I was able to switch from German to French. And it was wonderful for me because Demeringen was so small that I no longer needed to be in the company of a maid or my mother to do anything. I was allowed to just roam the countryside, the meadows and the farms uh, with my new friends. And uh, I got to see uh, you know, all kinds of farm animals and I saw all kinds of farm animals being born, little pigs, a calf, and I saw you know, chicken and geese, and uh, we picked flowers uh, along the little river. It, it was a wonderful experience. I also you know, picked a bucket, I remember, of escargot, which of course, my family still being kosher at that time, we weren't allowed to eat, but I gave them to a neighbor. I sold them to a neighbor at age uh, four. And uh, anyway, we spent, you know, this fir the first year in Stimmeringen and then moved on to Sargamin into an apartment building in Sargamin. And uh, I was able to start school in Sargamin, my first year of school. And at the end of that first school year, I got something I totally did not expect, a whole batch of books. I had received the Prix d'Excellence. And I also, during that first year, learned to truly love my new country, which I absolutely adopted immediately. It was ma patrie. I love the poetry uh, we learned because in France, uh, um, you one of the courses you had in every class starting in first grade, we learned poems. And one of the subjects was recitation. We had to get up in front of the class and recite these poems by heart. And I loved that. I loved, and I loved geography. I learned all about France immediately and, you know, history. It was so rich. It was, I was enthralled. France was wonderful. And at, you know, at that time, my mother actually taught me a prayer to say at night when I went to sleep. It was the Shema. And uh, I, diligently did the Shema, but as soon as I was finished with the Shema, I asked God to look after my beloved family, my beloved uh, uh, grandfather who was still in Germany at the time, my mother's father, and my beautiful country, ma patrie. The second year rolled around and uh, again, I got the Prix d'Excellence. But during that second year, something happened. For one thing, it was the year 37, 38. And in 1938, Kristallnacht took place. And we all know what Kristallnacht did. It was the night of broken glass. It was a night when the Germans felt free to burn down anything they wanted that was a Jewish possession, including synagogues, Jewish businesses. It was called the night of broken glass because they just broke the glass on every Jewish business uh, and store. They broke into Jewish homes. They humiliated the women. They took some of the men prisoners. Two of my uncles were taken prisoners to Dachau at that very moment. One of them was beaten to death that first week he was there. This death certificate read pneumonia, but since my other uncle was present when it happened, he knew it was not a pneumonia. He was beaten to death in Dachau. That uncle actually was liberated from Dachau because he already had papers to come to the United States. So the Germans were glad to get rid of him that way. But you know, one uncle was able to tell me the other one did not die of pneumonia. He was beaten to death. Right after that happened, my father offered our home or any way we could harbor anyone who wanted to come from Germany and live with us. My father's mother, who was then 83, uh, came, as did my uncle's two children, Leon, who was then 12, and uh, his sister, 14, Lucy. They came to live with us. Their mother didn't accompany them because for some reason, as so many Jews in Germany, she still had delusions. She was going to stay in Germany until she would be able to sell her business. 
So we were now a family of seven. Uh, it was quite a responsibility for my mother, uh, taking care of a you know, teenage boy, uh, but she took it on like a trooper. As a matter of fact, one of the things that happened, uh, my cousin Leon developed diphtheria while he was living with us. And while it was a very serious illness in those days, um, he should have been in a hospital, but we couldn't put him into the hospital because on every Friday night, his mother called and we didn't want her to know that he was ill. So every Friday night, my mother would take him piggyback to the phone because we had only one phone in the salon and so that he could speak to his mother so she wouldn't uh, get an inkling that he was ill. He recovered and uh, you know he had we had a, a wonderful doctor wonderful care and of course my mother's care in the meantime uh the evidence of war becoming closer and closer even after especially after kristallnacht was very evident you know there was poland there was the sudetenland there was czechoslovakia there was the anschluss with uh, of uh, austria and uh, in August of 1939, my father decided this was too dangerous. The only separation between Germany and the town we were living in was the little river Saar. We could have swum across it uh, with seven strokes. And uh, he did, you know, he decided it was not a good idea to stay. The town was getting ready for war itself too. All the major municipal buildings were being sandbagged to protect them against artillery. And all the main roads were being barricaded with uh, barbed wire. And at uh, every other street corner, somebody was demonstrating how to use a gas mask. Let's not forget, you know, this is 1939. It's not that long ago that the World War I uh, that World War I had taken place in that very region of France. So anyway, in August of 1939, uh, we decided to, to move further away from the uh, frontier. Uh, and we moved a little bit closer to you know, the Belgian border, moved west away from the German border, closer to the Belgian border unaware as was everyone else that the Germans were not going to be coming across this, you know, this line where the French had built this enormous Maginot defense line, but they simply went up through Belgium and came into France eventually. Uh, but this is, I'm jumping ahead. So in August of 1939, uh, we packed up uh, one of my father's trucks and one of my father's chauffeur drove the truck and my mother drove the private car and she packed you know, some odds and ends uh, for all seven of us and uh, very carefully put the, our Persian rugs in mothballs you know, so that they would be in good, to, good condition uh, when we came back because every expectation was that this war would not last very long and we would soon be coming back. We had illusions, obviously. So here we landed in this, you know, we drove as far as we could, but we had to stop at nighttime for a double reason. My father's chauffeur had already been drafted, number one, and had to get back. And number two, when the French military came by and saw the truck, they requisitioned the truck for the French military. And the, the chauffeur said, you can have it, you know, I will have it to you tomorrow, but I first I have to do this. So, you know, he did not want his family to get into trouble for having for being a deserter or anything. So at, at the end of the day, we was dark and we landed in this little tiny village called Longeville en Barrois. And the chauffeur drove back. Uh, 
we were no longer we no longer had the private car because somewhere along the road to Longeville, the private car had broken down and nobody knew how to fix it and we we couldn't wait so we all piled into the truck and uh, just left the car behind never to be seen again I arrived in Longeville spent the first night in a hotel and eventually found a place to live my, si my little sister and I went to a two-room schoolhouse and uh, my cousin Leon went, Leon went to another school for the boys in this small village. Uh, and the village, I think, was about a century behind in, you know, in modernity. They, when they couldn't understand uh, why my sister and I would not cross ourselves when we went to church with the group. Um, it was explained, you know, we explained that we were not Catholics, we were Juif. Well, they had no idea what a Juif was. They went home and asked around and the next day they had an explanation and they came and they wanted to see the horns underneath my sister's and my hair. Otherwise, no problems. Uh, the war did break out. And at first, it wasn't very serious. From time to time, there were skirmishes between airplanes. And uh, whenever that was, there were, you know, we were, there was an air raid, and we were sent to the cellars of the local farmers living near the uh, schoolhouse. And uh, these uh, cellars were totally dark because wine cellars have to be kept dark uh, for, the, for the wine. Since there was no schooling going on uh, during uh, these air raids, obviously in the darkness, uh, teachers and students immediately broke into pra uh, Catholic prayers. The separation between church and state was gone. So it was Ave Marias and Pater Nosters, which were the Catholic prayer then still said in Latin. The war became a little more serious and the French became totally paranoid about any foreigners in France. It didn't matter who or what they were, if you were foreign, particularly if you were German or anything resembling German, uh, you were suspect of being a member of the cinquième colonne, which was their terminology for being a spy. So one May afternoon, while my sister and I, for change, were in a cellar during an air raid, two policemen came to pick us up and brought us back to my family home. And... Uh, my mother was given an hour and a half to pack for all seven of us. Uh, we didn't really quite know what was happening, but we were taken by truck to a, the jail of the nearest large city, which is Bar-le-Duc, also still in the province of Lorraine. And in this jail, we were brought not to the jail actually, but to the stable where the horses used to be stabled and uh, we slept on the straw there. But before we could get there, we were searched. Every single one of us in every crevice of our body. My little sister had a curl on top of her head. They did that. They were looking for hidden secret documents, who knows what. It was humiliating to my little sister and me, two very modest children. Uh, and of course, they didn't find anything, and we uh, were in this facility with other foreign people. After a week, we were taken away from this uh, jail and uh, brought to the city of Commercy and loaded onto trains, passenger trains. And we were given a ration of bread and water and we're told that was for the trip. We had no idea where we were going or how long the trip would be. 
it became evident, uh, you know, just from recognizing the area we were traversing, um, that we were going south. Uh, there were seven of us in one compartment. We slept sitting up or lying down on the floor. My little sister was housed in the net hanging over the uh, one of the benches. Um, one of us slept with uh, a, a head in my mother's lap, somebody with a head in my grandmother's lap. Um, it was a very, very difficult period. And clearly we had didn't have enough to eat, which was particularly hard for a growing boy. My, my cousin Leon would plead with my mother, you know, for just another slice of bread, but my mother knew she did, there would be no breakfast in the next morning. It was, it was a very difficult period. So, you know, first I, I enjoyed traveling through that beautiful country of mine, I thought, you know, first seeing the wheat fields and then the coming further south, the Rhone Valley with the vineyards on both sides of the area. And at one point, all of a sudden, I saw a glimpse of the Mediterranean, blue glimpse of the Mediterranean, and I was enthralled. Adding to our hunger, I have to add that whenever the train stopped in a station, my father would try to elicit somebody to sell him something, some food, and they would spit at him and walk away. And at one point on the trip to the south, uh, the train stopped and we were let off the train while the steam engine needing a lot of water was refilled in the middle of nowhere. And we finally saw why nobody wanted to do anything for us. The train had been marked in very large letters, prisonniers de guerre, prisoners of war, no wonder. Well, when we got to the Mediterranean, thrilled as I was, the Mediterranean was immediately out of sight because the train was veering west. After, you know, it was, it had been eight days when we finally stopped at a place called Oloron Sainte Marie at the foot of the Pyrenees in the southwest of France. Uh, here we were taken off the train, loaded onto trucks, and then it first became apparent to us that all the luggage that my mother had packed so carefully in the short time that she had been given was lost. Not the only pieces of luggage were left were the two pieces of hand luggage that my parents had taken with them, which they carried personal papers and uh, some money, uh, some, you know, invaluable objects but when we arrived we that was we had the clothes on our backs that was it the trucks soon arrived at a huge place called gurs and this is what we saw this is gurs internment camp it had not that I counted them, I learned it later, 400 barracks. It extended over two kilometers along the road. The barracks were made of tar paper and wood, no windows. It had actually not been built for us. It had originally been built in 19, at the beginning of 1939, when the Spanish Republicans were defeated by Franco. Franco who was helped by fascist Italy, by fascist Germany, and to a large extent uh, whose tanks and trucks uh, were kept going thanks to the oil being supplied by American oil companies. But Franco defeated the Republicans who had won the election in uh, Spain and the war which lasted from 1936 to 1939 uh, was 
you know, a terrible defeat. The other people who had come to help the, Rep the Republicans were called the International Brigade. Uh, and they were young men from all over European countries, young idealists, many of them were young professionals, doctors, journalists, uh, lawyers, uh, engineers, uh, uh, you know, very, very dedicated young men. Uh, so this camp was built to receive them because France did not want them dispersing all over, all over France. Uh, many of them, in, in addition to this, were communists and you know, really nobody wanted them. So here we were separated from my cousin Leon and my father who were sent to the men's section and we were taken to a particular ilo, which is one section, meaning a small island. <clears throat> and we were put into a barrack which was totally dedicated to children and their mothers. And we saw, you know, there were many, many other children, most of them much, much younger than my sister and I, and uh, very many young mothers of many different nationalities. There were Austrians and Hungarians and Belgians and Germans, a, a, a gypsy, an elderly gypsy grandmother, uh, and uh, the food was very bad. But um, even my grandmother ha had to eventually accept that kosher or no kosher, edible or no edible, it was the only thing there was. Uh, water was available uh, certain times of the day only, as you can see here, for uh, washing, for drinking, and for doing laundry. And why was laundry, doing laundry very important to us? Well. Here are the clothes we arrived in, and these are the clothes we had, because we had nothing to change into. Everything had been lost. So every morning, my mother washed my sister's and my underwear and left it to dry in the sun, which was sort of embarrassing for us because for the first part of the morning, we were walking around you know, with our derrieres uh, uh, bit naked, and uh, to make matters worse, I was wearing a hand knitted dress that my mother had made. Uh, and, you know, the women were very complimentary about it. And they kept looking, you know, lifting the hem to see the stitches better. Uh, it, as children, we did not fully experience what a dreadful place this was. And we, we invented games, for instance, we used the the chickpeas from our chickpea soup, which was undercooked, we used the chickpeas uh, as marbles. We made marble games and we took long walks. We, we adopted one of the women's uh, very young little boy named Roland. And we took Roland on walks uh, you know, throughout the camp, our section of the camp so that his mother would have a little rest. He was a difficult little boy. Uh, and he had recently learned how to walk. <coughs> My mother, all five feet of her, was a dynamo when she needed something. Not only did we arrive with, without any luggage, but when my parents took what they thought was their hand luggage, they got the wrong one. She had my father's, my father had hers. And there were certain medications that my father needed in hers. And she spoke to the commandant, the French uh, military in charge of the camp and explained the situation. And he was kind enough to give us a special pass so that we were allowed to walk to where my father was, which was quite a distance under the hot sun in particular. And this is when we first learned what this camp was about, you know, that it was not built for us, but that it was built for the Spaniards because my father, after the first night at the Gurs could not be could not remain there. He could not get on the ground to sleep on the straw, uh, on the straw mattresses. He was taken to the hospital. Um, we were able to sleep on straw mattresses, you know, with all the bed bugs and the lice and the fleas and the rats. But my father was taken to the hospital. 
um, which was a very good place to be because this hospital, which you know the Spaniards uh, needed for all of their wounded after they came back out of uh, Spain, many of them terribly maimed, missing one arm, missing both arms, missing one leg or both legs or an arm and a leg, blind, uh, in terrible condition. Um, but there was a wonderful spirit of camaraderie amongst them all. And as I said earlier, um, the members of the International Brigade, many, you know, many of them were there as well. And they helped in, you know, they helped uh, make things easier for them. And they set up a hospital. The doctors set up a hospital. Uh, one of the doctors was a young you know, Polish pediatrician. Um, you know, here is uh, the young Polish pediatrician who, after taking one look at the two of us, decided we were badly undernourished and he scavenged around and got some vitamins for us. And we also met uh, you know, some of the Spaniards. Uh, the image before was a Spanish captain who also you know, came to us and uh, he had two eggs, but he wanted to show us that the eggs you know, were already cooked. We didn't have to worry and he hit them together. You know, they didn't speak French and we didn't speak Spanish. Um, so that, my father was very well taken care of there, you know, as well taken care of as we could, hoped, could have hoped. My poor cousin Leon was left behind. By that time, he was 13 and uh, he was in the men's camp. And, uh, you know, uh, as a teenager, probably learned a lot of about the facts of life, et cetera, from these many of them very young, grown men. We were in Gurs, and uh, as I said, my sister and I had some vitamins, uh, and we were the only children in our entire barrack of children who did not get dysentery. Number one, because we had had the help of the uh, vitamins. Uh, and number two, because my mother was so strict about our observing sanitary laws, you know, about washing our hands constantly when we used the latrines. Uh, we, you know, she was a demon about it and it paid off. We did get lice, she couldn't prevent that. Uh, the French folded very, very quickly. Uh, in, within six weeks, it, the war was over. And uh, actually the first people who came to Gurs eventually were you know, the Germans. And uh, they knew what Gurs was about. And they said that we could go back home because so many people, and we were not there as Jews, we were there as foreigners. And as I said, many of them were Germans. You can go back to Germany. Germany is German, you know. You can go back to Alsace-Lorraine. Alsace-Lorraine is German now. You can go back to the upper part of France because it is now occupied by the Germans and it is your country again. You can go back to Belgium or the Netherlands and anywhere you come from uh, because it is, now German again. And uh, some people left immediately. We were a little bit dubious uh, uh, because we didn't really know where to go or what was really happening. Uh, happening. Be and during the first few weeks after this, some people were coming back because they had encountered such chaos uh, that they didn't, didn't know where to go. Well, after a bit, my father, the camp was emptying out and my father decided, you know, we had, we had to go. He telegraphed his brother who was already in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the one who had left to Dachau with his family and asked whether he would pay for the, uh, fair for the boat ride of the grandmother and my two cousins who had affidavits to come to the United States. And Uncle Nathan promptly re returned, yes, of course. 
And then my father got in touch with a friend he had in Lyon, which is, Lyon is the uh, third largest city in France, and asked whether there would be a way for us to come there and whether we, you know, there would be some housing of so. And our friend Raymond Levy, uh, you know, answered yes, uh, it, not to worry, he would help us. So we, so one morning we all got together. It was the first time the seven of us were together again. Uh, my mother had sewn some little knapsacks from these um, cotton covering of the straw. Um, one of uh, the Spaniards had made a, a wooden valise for my father. And uh, of course we didn't have very many belongings uh, anyway. And in the same clothing that we had when we arrived three months earlier, we encountered one another again. And my mother, who had a great sense of humor, couldn't help but break out laughing because we looked so pitiful. And you know, once she laughed, we were able to laugh as well. This is a picture taken just before we left uh, Gurs. Uh, you know, my father, you know, hiding his left arm, which is paralyzed, you know, very proud, very erect, my mother, my cousin Leon, my 83-year-old grandmother, my little sister, Edith, always a smile, even more impervious to what was really happening than I was, my cousin Lucy, you know, who was more aware of what was happening. So we left Gurs on a truck and uh, were brought to the first town where we could buy our tickets and uh, try to buy something to eat at the first restaurant in this town. It's the first time we were going to eat anything on, on a plate and or, or drink my parents were going to drink coffee from a real cup instead of an empty uh, tin can. And the restaurateur took one look at the gang <laughs> and uh, said there was a Red Cross soup kitchen or something like it down the road. That's how pitiful look we looked. Well, we took a train to Toulouse which is at a, a central point in southwestern France, uh, which was properly located so that my grandmother and the children and the, the cousins could go to Marseille, where they would pick up some sort of transportation, possibly uh, to the United States. The other coastlines of France were out of question. They were now German. They were now occupied by the Germans. This is occupied France. We didn't realize it at the time that this part of France was to become Vichy France. And this is where we were going. So in Toulouse, uh, we said goodbye to my grandmother and the two children, which was a very difficult moment for my father, the youngest of three children, um, who had been brought back to health by my grandmother after this terrible, terrible injury and sending her, 83 years old, not speaking a word of French to a town which none of us had ever seen before, Marseille. And Marseille had a well-known reputation of being a very sort of wild international seaport the two children were going to be taking care of her. You know, particularly Leon, who, even though he was 13, was, you know, very savvy and knew how to get around and make his wishes known. Anyway, saying good night, goodbye to my grandmother was a very hard moment for all of us, but particularly for my father. We arrived in Lyon. And our friend Raymond eventually was not easy, helped us. We stayed at a hotel at first, but we found an apartment. 
not in Lyon, but in Villeurbanne, which is directly adjacent to Lyon, in a, uh, a building called Built à l'Américaine, an American type of building. They were the Graziel of Villeurbanne, meaning the skyscrapers, the tallest of which was 22 stories high. We got an apartment there. We found an apartment. Of course, we didn't have any furniture, nor any way of buying furniture. Um, people, you know, the concierge of the building had some furniture sitting in the in the cellar, a bed, and we we bought a bed, and we bought uh, somebody found a chaise longue for us. Somebody found a uh, an armchair for us, but the main thing was we had one bed, no mattress uh, yet, uh, so that my father could lie down. Eventually, uh, you know, my mother discovered some uh, thrift stores and uh, we bought some secondhand furniture and also some secondhand clothing and shoes for my sister and me, because it wasn't just that we, you know, uh, we were outgrowing things. We didn't have anything to change into. Things that were pretty rough from the beginning on uh, food was rationed, bread, flour, sugar, uh, meat. Not only was it rationed, but even with coupons, very often things were not available. And my mother would have to, you know, stand in line, uh, at start standing in a queue uh, at five o'clock in the morning in order to make sure she was able to benefit from what was being sold, even with the Russian coupons. But my sister and I, uh, started school um, at the Ecole Anatole France uh, in an all girls school. And we were kind of unaware. Here is a photograph of a school photograph. Uh, here is Renee, and here is her little sister. Um, and uh, we were you know, very content in our school. Uh, uh, following, doing very well with our new classmates, our new teachers. Um, uh, there were a few innovations we became aware of, such as instead of when the flag was raised, instead of seeing the Marseillaise, we sang Maréchal, nous voilà, you know, an ode to the Maréchal. Maréchal Pétain was the new leader of France. Maréchal Pétain, uh, was in charge of the new France, which is also called Vichy France. And the very first thing Maréchal Pétain had ordained uh, was to establish a new ministry to make himself uh, uh, likeable, you know, liked by the Germans even more so. Uh, and it was a ministry to deal with la question juive, the Jewish question. And uh, in charge of this ministry de la question juive was uh, somebody named Pierre Laval, a well-known, virulent anti-Semite. Within weeks of this happening, uh, and these are things I found out later, uh, there were armies of lawyers who set out to find out what really made someone a Jew, Jew. You know, how long ago need you have been baptized for it to count as you no longer being a Jew? Uh, how recently were your ancestors not Jewish? Um, there also were laws declaring that you, know, uh, you could not attend university to become uh, a doctor, a lawyer, a, an engineer, or any of the you know, higher areas of education, uh, even the school that I would have gone to had 1942 not turned out the way it did, um, I would not have been allowed to go to a lycée because I was Jewish. But I was unaware of all of that. I was blissfully coming along. The only suspicion I had was occasionally when on Saturday afternoons, I went to the movies and the movies incidentally, which I saw were Westerners, Westerns. 
and I was convinced that cowboys spoke only French because everything was dubbed. But I loved the cowboy movies we saw. But these movies were also they were, uh, paired with uh, Le Réalité, which is newsreels. And in Le Réalité, we learned something that uh, sort of seems strange, even to me, uh, not politically savvy. And that was the following. Uh, you know, the French were praising, the newsreels were praising our friends, the Germans, for the wonderful defense systems that they were building along the uh, marsh and along the North Sea and along the Atlantic Ocean to protect us from the British. And uh, that seemed rather strange. Uh, I, you know, I, I was sort of under the impression the British were France's allies, but okay, that was bad enough. And then at the same newsreels, I saw uh, you know, news about an exhibit that was taking place in Paris at that time to help Frenchmen identify a Jew when they saw one. And they even had a poster. And this was a, a yellow poster of a creature with clawed hands and a hooked nose and warts all over uh, his face. And underneath uh, it said, uh, this is le juif sus, typical of the Jews in terms who are like rats, in terms of how they procreate and take away what belongs to us. It, uh, you know, first of all, I didn't know any Jews who looked like that. And it, I, I was a little bit uh, flustered, but again, didn't give it too much second thought and didn't discuss it with my parents. The school year 1941-42 rolled around. And in June of 1942, uh, there was an assembly at the end of uh, the school year. And we were assembled in, in the schoolyard with our arms crossed behind our back, uh, you know, standing nice and straight. And uh, the Madame la Directrice got up, principal, and uh, she had a book in her hand and she announced uh, the Maréchal has designated this book to be a prize to go to a student who has been chosen by her teachers and her fellow students for scholarship and sportsmanship. Hesitation. However, I cannot bring myself to give this to René Khan, someone of her race, a race that has caused our country so much trouble and harm already. Instead, I will give it to Monique Gaz. Needless to say, I absolutely you know, crumbled like an accordion, uh, you know, with my, my face in my little apron. My teachers tried to console me to no avail. Uh, we, my sister and I, started our way home. We, fortunately, it was no, there was no school the next day. I didn't have to face anybody the next day. And we came home. And of course, I told my mother this dreadful experience. And incidentally, it, I never realized until many, many, many years later, my mother never told any of the terrible things that happened to my sister and to me, including that particular event to my father because due to his brain injury, when my father was upset and nervous, he would have a seizure similar to an epileptic seizure, a nervous breakdown that was very, very dangerous to him because if he fell, he had no way of catching himself. He would have broken something. So she just kept it from him entirely. And within a day or so of this event, my mother took my sister and me to Lyon, to the old part of Lyon where we had never been before. And we found this you know, very old house, walked in there and met with a woman. I didn't even know her name at the time. And uh, you know, spoke to her, she asked some questions. 
and then we went home. And when we got home, my mother explained to us that we were going to the Massif Central the next day, that Madame Dreyfus was taking us to the Massif Central. Well, I was enthralled. The Massif Central was one of the mountain ranges in France. It was in central France. It wasn't as high as the Alps or the Pyrenees, but uh, I knew my geography. It was a volcanic uh, eruption. And uh, over time, it was really no longer a mountain, but a plateau called Plateau de Cévennes. But it was still you know, countryside and almost a mountain. And I was delighted. And uh, my mother packed a little knapsack for each of us and with an apple, a toothbrush, a first aid kit, uh, a sweater, a change of underwear, um, some pajamas. And uh, the next morning took us to the, one of the railroad stations in Lyon and we met Madame Dreyfus. Hello. Yes, yes, hi, hi. <laughs> Madame Dreyfus took us onto a train, and this train first stopped in Saint Etienne, which is a fairly large city. And in Saint Etienne, we changed to a smaller train. And very soon, that small train started to go up uh, a hill, a mountain. And uh, you know, the, the windows, of course, were open windows of our compartment. And um, uh, you know, we were getting the soot that was coming back from the coal that was being burned to make steam for the steam engine. Um, it was entertaining just watching the countryside. But before long, the train stopped at a place called Le Chambon sur Lignon. And we got off and uh, uh, this is when I first realized that this perhaps was not quite the vacation mountain I thought it was because there was a family there that was ready to receive my sister. Um, and they took my sister, but not me. The family that supposedly was taking me had not been able to come as yet. So the first night I stayed with a Madame Deliage. And uh, you know, nobody really said very much. Um, the only thing Madame Dreyfus had said to us, to the two of us, was that we would not be able to receive any mail from our parents and not to talk too much about our background. You know. Well, the next morning, somebody came in this little tiny cart with that was pulled by a mule or a donkey, I'm not sure, and uh, took the man driving it and me. And for about an hour and a half, we went through meadows and forests and more meadows and more forests and arrived eventually after about an hour and a half at a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. This is the house, which is a photograph I took in 1990 when I went back to visit. But at the time, it still looked pretty much the same. As I said, this was the house. This was, this was the stable. Uh, this is the view on one side of the house, and this is the view on the other side of the house. There was no evidence of civilization anywhere east, west, north, or south. There was no electricity, no running water. At the time I was there, there was in front of the house a trough with a pump, uh, which you know, served all our water needs. And the house itself uh, had one large room, which was the kitchen, the living room, the dining room. And in that kitchen, dining room, living room, there was an indentation, which was an alcove. And um, that was where I was going to sleep. The family consisted of Monsieur and Madame Fournier and their 19-year-old son, Marcel. And Marcel, that was Marcel's bed, actually. This is Marcel in 1990. Marcel, who is you know, a bit older than I. And uh, 
he was still around. But uh, uh, so Marcel was you know, sent to sleep with his parents and I had the alcohol. It was very isolated. You know, in addition to having no contact with the outside world of any sort, you know, imagine, you know, television hadn't been invented. There was no phone, there were no newspapers, there were no books, uh, uh, there was no radio, there was nothing. Uh, or, you know, the, the first time I, the next morning, I brushed my teeth, they called each other over to see what a strange thing I was doing. They had never seen anything like it. Well, uh, my days were very simple. Uh, with breakfast uh, and uh, Madame, you know, and then I helped Madame Fournier to, you know, to do the dishes and uh, to pick some vegetables in the vegetable garden and to see if there were any eggs in the hen house. And uh, then uh, I would accompany Marcel uh, to herd the cow and the goat, one of each, uh, to a meadow not far from there. We walked to this meadow, which was lovely, and there were other young herders, all boys, all older than I was, uh, with their, you know, cattle. And, um, you know, the young men entertained themselves and each other, but nobody paid any attention to me, and I really had nothing to, to talk to them about. So what do I do all day long? So there was a little brook running at the bottom of this uh, meadow, actually, this was the Lignon, you know, Ch Chambon sur Lignon, meaning Chambon on the Lignon. Lignon is the little river that runs through there and eventually goes to the Loire Valley. So I played with the pebbles of the, in, in this little brook. And uh, also I got Marcel uh, to cut some of the tall ferns which I then stripped and tried to weave into a basket. Not successfully, but it kept me busy. Uh, the weeks went by, the days went by, and uh, things didn't get any easier. Uh, for one thing, the family uh, were not speaking to me, were speaking in a local dialect, Auvergne, which I didn't understand at all. It's, it's a form of French, but you know, unless you're accustomed to hearing it, you know, it's, it's like for German trying to understand uh, Swedish or Dutch. Monsieur Chournier had taken me to visit my little sister to see where she was. And she was very well taken care of. She lived with a family, uh, the family of a railroad worker who had a little boy same age my, as my sister, nine years old, and she seemed very content and happy, which was very comforting to me because I was very concerned for her. It, my little sister was you know, not only younger, but very delicate, and um, I, I was delighted that she was taken care of. Soon, three little girls appeared at the farm. They were from Saint Etienne. And I carefully assumed that they were members of the family, having come to spend the summer with their uncles and aunts or whatever. And uh, they must have assumed the same about me because while we slept in the same bed, they at one end and I at the other end, they did not speak to me, I did not speak to them. We completely ignored each other. So instead of providing me with companionship, my isolation became even greater. Monsieur Fournier occasionally went into town and came back with some news. Uh, you know, he, he didn't read the newspaper. I doubt very much uh, that he was literate. Um, you know, one day he came back and he brought back the news that Lyon had been very badly bombed by the British. And uh, then a few weeks later, um, Marcel stopped me from going to the brook. He said, René, don't play near the water. I hear that the police have poisoned the brook because the police 
heard that some Jews were hiding out in the area and they would be using this water as drinking water. That seemed pretty horrible. Within days of hearing that story, Monsieur Fournier came back again with lo loaded with news from town, from the cafe where he stopped. And these were, René, don't expect to find your parents when you come back. Because I heard that they had numerous, numerous rafles, the French word for raids, in the Lyon area, and they got all the Jews. That was pretty horrible, and I don't know whether I lasted one day or two days or even three days. But you know, I developed a nervous tick. I was, I was beside myself. And uh, one morning after breakfast, I uh, you know put my part of my breakfast in my um, little knapsack, and I said to Madame Fournier, uh, "I think I want to visit my sister today." And um, you know, she knew I, I knew the road to visit my sister. Her husband had shown me, and she didn't question me, and I left. And when I got to my little sister's place, with great aplomb, I said, we need to get home. And they didn't question this 11-year-old in charge of a nine-year-old in a country where nobody wanted them, or almost nobody wanted them, making such a trip. So my little sister, when my little sister never questioned anything I said to her, we take off and, uh, you know, the family she was with being in the railroad uh, trade, they helped us find the station and helped us, you know, find the, buy the tickets. And uh, I bought the tickets. We took a train to Saint-Étienne, changed the platforms and trains in Saint-Étienne, took a train to Lyon, arrived in Lyon, took a streetcar from the station to Villeurbanne, where my family lived, and went to find my parents. Ring the bell, no answer. Of course, through all this, my sister had no inkling as to why we suddenly had to get home. Whatever I said, she trusted implicitly. So I still didn't let on. And uh, I said to her, well, maybe they went for a walk. Let's go sit in this park, you know, this park not far from there. And we did. And a little while later, we went to ring the bell again. No answer, of course. And a miracle, one of the miracles that helped my family survive happened. Our next door neighbor, on the same floor was a masseur who had given massages to both my parents. He was blind and being blind, he had an extraordinary sense of hearing. He not only recognized my speaking to my little sister, but he had overheard what happened to my parents. So he came out of his apartment and took me in and uh, explained to me where my parents were. To make a long story short, I had many friends in Villeurbanne, but my best friend was somebody named René Cossidière. She was the only child of Louis and Louise Cossidière, who were the janitors of a municipal building that housed a municipal clinic, a municipal pool, a municipal theater, municipal offices, and their apartment. The municipal offices at that particular point were being used to house the Pétain police, which were the, the counterpart of the Gestapo, the people who, whose job it was to round up the Jews for deportation. One morning, Monsieur Cossidier in the bathroom, which was a common bathroom for their apartment and the uh, offices of the, where these people were staying, 
overheard them slap, you know, here saw them slapping each other on the back and with great glee saying to each other, this is it, tonight we're getting them all. You know, it was always done at night because, you know, these Jews weren't going, you know, weren't going anywhere at night. In the daytime, they might've missed them. So Monsieur Cossidier, who had never met my parents, who knew I was Jewish, who knew where I lived, stopped to tell his wife what he was doing, where he was going. She agreed with him wholeheartedly, you know, without hesitation. And he walked over to my parents, explained his, what he had heard and his intention. And my parents, in full agreement with him, grateful, of course, followed him and he took them to his apartment, a large room directly next door to the very people who were gung-ho on arresting my parents. That very night, my parents watched from the Cossidier's window as their friends and acquaintances were being loaded onto trucks and buses to be taken away. So that's how my parents were saved. Again, the fact that my sister and I had been so, that I had been so terrified as to come back to uh, the Urban is something my mother never told my father. You know, my father wrote a journal in which uh, at one point uh, he talks about the children being safe. You know, he talks about the episode of being hidden himself uh, by the Cossidiers, but thank God the children were safe in the mountains. He had no idea of, of our terror. So my mother marched us back to the apartment where we spent the night. She went back to the Cossidiers and uh, the next morning, my mother took us back to uh, Lyon, to Madame Dreyfus. Madame Dreyfus took us back to Le Chambon, my sister to the same family, and I was taken to a different family where I was you know, very much, much happier. It was a, a pension, a boarding house, and there were many, many other little girls. Um, you know, while we all knew we were not members of the family, we didn't talk very much about why we were there and who we were. There, was all, there also were books in the place. It was a much healthier atmosphere. My parents in the meantime, as things became more and more untenable and dangerous in France. And of course, I, you know, I, I have to stress that in addition to all these laws, concentration camps were all over France, you know, concentration camps with beautiful French names, but concentration camps uh, were springing up to receive these Jews. They were not extermination camps, but they were deportation camps, camps from which French military deported the Jews on French railroads to German you know, ex extermination camps. Anyway, my parents realizing what was happening had made arrangements to try to cross the Swiss border. They had hired a passeur, which is a smuggler. They had paid for uh, false papers uh, to, you know, whereby our name was no longer Can, but Weber. And uh, uh, they had bought tickets taking us from Lyon to Basel, Switzerland, which is at the other end of Switzerland from where we were intending to cross. Um, and Basel, incidentally, is at the, you know, has a triple frontier, one with, I mean, a double frontier, one with France and one with Germany. Uh, very you know, close to Germany. But anyway, uh, we came back, we were taken back to Lyon by Madame uh, Dreyfus and informed of this uh, new development, um, had to make sure we did not take anything with us that might bear our real name. Although I think my, I know that my parents somehow, somewhere had to have hidden their real papers because eventually they would need them. But we had a hard time convincing my sister 
that her name was now Edith Weber, no longer Edith Kahn. She, she thought that was very, very funny. She was going around the apartment mimicking uh, you know, her new name. Um, so one morning it became, it, the, the morning came when we were going to leave France for board a train in uh, Lyon to take us to the Swiss border. And um, the smuggler would not get on the same, in the same compartment with us because he was afraid, because you know, every so often a French police or German police and the French police were just as dangerous as the as German police would go around checking uh, papers uh, to you know, make sure nobody was going someplace where he or she should not be going. And um, certainly on a train going east to Switzerland or to the Swiss border. So the smuggler was in another compartment. Um, sometime bef before we got to Annecy, where we were supposed to cross the border, uh, we got off that train uh, because he wasn't going to stay on the train. We were, and um, it was in the late afternoon and uh, we stopped at a cafe, which was part of the rendezvous for the next smuggler to take us on. And here, what happened was this next smuggler did not arrive, but somebody came to tell us that the whole thing had fallen through because the night before the border patrol had intercepted not only the Jews trying to cross the refugees, but the smugglers who accompanied them and taken them all straight north to the German concentration camps. And I have to say here that to the north were the German border patrols, to the south were the French border patrols, and to the east were the Swiss border patrols. And the Swiss were not eager to have any more refugees come into Switzerland either. You know, they were being deluged from, by refugees from Germany, from Austria, from Italy, and from France. And um, it's a small landlocked country. They did not want more refugees. So at this point, you know, my mother, who had been the a fort of courage throughout this whole thing, blanched. And I saw her virtually losing it. And my father had to plead with my sister and with me, he says, you know, sort of revive my mother, which we ended up, you know, doing. And, um, you know, my, they wanted my father to pay them more. Some other smugglers, you know, wanted more money. But, you know, we just, you know, smelled a rat. And we didn't have you know, more money to, to give to this. We had already spent the bulk of what we had. And of course, needless to say, we were arriving with virtually nothing. Eventually, some arrangements were made to put us on a bus that started to take us towards the border. And we got on that bus and um, then the bus stopped and there was a car, an old car standing there. So decrepit that the doors didn't close. The doors had to be locked by tying a rope around the handles. And it was driven by what looked like a 15 year old boy. And um, we got on there and he drove to a point where there was a barn. He walked, we walked into the barn with this boy and he walked through the barn to the other end of the barn and pointed to three lights in the distance and said, you see the middle light? You walk to that middle light, they're expecting you. What do you mean? You're not coming with us? Of course you're coming with us. No, 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 no. Well, all pleading was for naught and you know, we realized we were wasting time and we finally took off. Um, 
what he was pointing at was a freshly plowed field. This is October and uh, it had rained the entire week before a freshly plowed field to walk through is no picnic. And the last warning this young man gave to us, he said, stay centered on that light. Don't veer to the right. The French are uh, on the you know, French police are going to get you there. Don't veer to the left. The Germans are there. And to the you know, uh, uh, south, south right, um, you have the Swiss Border Patrol. And they would kick you back too. We had no choice and we started walking, my little sister holding on my, to my father, walking with his cane through this flesh, freshly plowed field and my sister, my mother and I carrying uh, whatever valise we had. Um, we were of course not allowed to talk to one another. At one point, as it started to get much darker, my little sister uh, came found us to say that my father had fallen and couldn't get up and certainly she couldn't help him so we you know the we went back to my father and uh, uh, between the three of us we were able to get him up and since this was all soft mud besides being covered in mud from head to toe he blessedly had not injured himself well before going much further, the three lights started to become a dozen lights and 30, 40, it looked like a hundred lights in the distance. And we had no light, no idea anymore which the center light towards which we were walking was, but we had no choice. We just kept walking. And it was getting later and later and later, little by little, all the lights started to go out altogether. Finally, there was only one light left and we were very close to it. And we walked towards that light. It was the only thing we could do. And as we approached the light, um, a dog started to bark and a woman opened the door and seeing us, moved, you know, motioned us in and she said, you are very lucky. The Swiss border patrol just left this house five minutes ago. They are in the next farm down the road. Had you arrived five minutes earlier, you would be gone. As she also fed us, you know, some some lovely Swiss food, some bread and butter and jam, and helped to clean up my dad a little bit. And then she instructed her son, her teenager, to walk us over to a place she knew where there was an empty house. And the house was truly empty. It was you know, in the same town, wherever that was. We were in, in, in French speaking Switzerland. And, um, but you know, we needed one more thing. My father couldn't sleep on the floor. So we got the young man to knock on the neighbors, near neighbors, house and get us one chair so my father could at least sit for the night and sleep. The very next morning, somebody knocked on the door downstairs and my sister and I went down and um, there were two little girls our age and the older one said, le déjeuner est prêt, breakfast is ready. Which mean, we went down, we you know, told our parents my parents accompanied us and they wanted to pay for the breakfast, but they wouldn't allow us. And when we explained that our aim was to somewhat, somehow get to Geneva so that we could take a train from Geneva to Basel, um, they said, well, that wasn't until after lunch. Uh, there, there would be a bus that would take us there after lunch. So. They fed us lunch for which again, they would not accept any money. It was a small cafe actually. And after lunch, their older son who was a teenager took our luggage so that we would not look suspect and uh, walked with us to the bus station, spoke to the bus driver to explain to him exactly at what station 
in Geneva, he was to tell us to get off, you know, helped us pay for our bus fare. And we off we went. We were now in Switzerland. Uh, why were we not happy to stay in Geneva? Well, my father knew that under international law, if the Swiss police or border patrol had intercepted us, even in, in Geneva, they were, had the right to send us back across the border. As long as we could prove that we had crossed the border 50 kilometers away from where we were intercepted, we were okay. That's why we went on to Basel. And in Basel, we arrived very late at night. We went to a hotel. The hotel insisted on having our uh, identification papers, which my parents tried very hard not to give them, but they insisted because that was the law. Basel being so close to the border, uh, the police were very cognizant of the fact that, you know, uh, a lot of foreigners might be stopping by whom they didn't want. So, and sure enough, the next morning at 5 a.m., the police were knocking at our door and uh, gave us a little extra time to get washed and ready uh, to accompany them to the station. We, they of course, informed us once we were arrived at the station that while they could not send us back to France, uh, they could put us, they were going to put us into a Swiss concentration camp. Swiss concentration camps are not extermination, were not extermination camps, but they were camps to keep people, the, the, the many, many refugees from flooding Switzerland. Well, my father had a very good friend in Basel and he point, who was a lawyer. And uh, he said, you know, would they please give us enough time to contact this lawyer and see if he couldn't do anything for us. And as it turned out, he was a very well-respected lawyer. So they gave us permission, you know, to stay a week in Basel uh, at a hotel at a different hotel near the very near the uh, state, you know, the police station. And of course, they searched us from one end to the other to see if we had, you know, we really were who we said we were. And they, they took everything away from us. Um, but they gave it back to us eventually. <laughs> Another weird miracle happened. And that is that as soon as we got to that hotel, my sister and I, first I, my little sister, a few days later, came down with, with an illness. They couldn't identify it at first what it was. Uh, I had a fever. I, would, I was dreadfully nauseous. The, the sound of paper rustling reminded me of food and hence caused me to be nauseous. They, nobody could figure out what it was. After a few days you know, of this happening, I'm being unable to eat anything uh, uh, and you know, constant vomiting and fever. Um, I was taken to the local children's hospital. And by that time, it also became evident that I was no longer a pale redhead, but a yellow redhead, because I was yellow and my eyes were yellow. And they took blood tests and I had what they called ansteckende Gelbsucht, which means contagious yellow jaundice, which in turn is hepatitis. A few days, and I was put into this glass, literally a glass cage. You know, except for the floor, everything in that uh, room was glass. And uh, I was attended by one very young nun, nun, one elderly nun, and a doctor named Dr. Adler. A few days after I arrived there, my sister joined me. We were there for six weeks, very ill, but we recovered frequent blood tests, which were 
terrible because in those days, needles were much, much heavy, fatter needles than we have now. But eventually we recovered. And meanwhile, my mother had decided no way was she going to stay in the hotel for six weeks. She couldn't afford that. She had moved to an apartment, much to the horror of the, the police, where they had to report every Saturday afternoon. Well, the police had no choice. When we got sick, my parents couldn't afford to stay in the hotel, and they had to allow my parents to stay in that apartment. Uh, and my parents had to report to the police every Saturday afternoon. Well, we got out of the hospital and now they were ready to put us into a concentration camp. God bless Dr. Adler. Dr. Adler, in whose care we continue to be, said, no, 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 that cannot be. You cannot put these two children into a concentration camp. They are still contagious. It would be terrible to put them into such a crowded surrounding. At which, at which point, the Swiss police acquiesced and allowed us to stay in this you know, very, very slum area apartment. But we were happy to be there. Edith and I started school, this time switching from French to German again. And uh, spent the rest of our time in Switzerland. So here we are. Renee, thank you so much. It's an unbelievable story. And I mean, and we're getting the perspective from you as a young child, and yet the story of what you do as a young child is, uh, is staggering. And uh, so thank you for sharing it with us. I know that we have a few stories. I'm gonna ask Michael to, uh, to come back on and I'm gonna spotlight him uh, just to, to, I know that some questions have already come in and if other people have them, please post them in the chat or raise your hand and we'll call on you. So uh, Michael, can I pass the baton back to you and you can pose a couple of the questions that I know that have come in? Sure, thank you so much, Thor and Renee. Thank you so much for for sharing your testimony with all of us. It was packed with so much information and so much detail. It's incredible that you have these stories to share with us and you kept everyone's attention uh, for the entire time, which is so beautiful. So I appreciate you and appreciate everyone here. Um, did want to start with asking um, uh, one question. As Thorin said, you spoke from uh, someone young and you mentioned your experience when you were four years old, enthralled at this parade and then having this um, childhood imagination, turning chickpeas into marbles um, and noticing the beauty of the scenery um, on your way down to the um, internment camps. So I'm just wondering uh, how your mother, for example, remembered um, the experiences and did she ever share those um, stories or her experiences with you at the time or after? Well, this is a very good question. My mother was an extraordinary person. And as I said, at the very beginning, even before start, the war started, my two cousins and my grandmother had come to be with us. My mother had no problem becoming a surrogate mother to these two young children, but she had a very hard time. Her mother-in-law, was a very difficult woman. My grandmother uh, was a very difficult woman who didn't have a kind word to say to my to either one of her daughter-in-laws and particularly not to my mother. Uh, so navigating through emigration with this elderly person and all the worries and worrying about her husband uh, uh, trying to prevent his learning about some of the worst situations we experienced, um, shielding him, protecting him, um, you know, caring for him. Um, I became aware at age eight, actually, of my mother's burden. And I, I think at that point became her only friend, not only shared caring valises with her, but, you know, 
it's not that she cried on my shoulder, but I could see what burdens she had to carry. And I, I think um, that's the only, the best answer I can give you. Um, she, I think, when also uh, bearing so many of the problems my sister and I experienced, particularly I, um, by herself, not sharing them with her husband, made it even worse for her. You know, it, it, it was hard enough to hear of the devastation I experienced, the humiliation I experienced, but not even being able to share it with the other adult in her life must have been very, very hard. The other thing about my mother was that, you know, her favorite person in the world next to her husband and he, her children was her father, who was also my favorite person next to everyone else. And uh, he had not made it out of Germany. His children had you know, emigrated to Brazil. He had not made it. And um, you know, we kept hoping against hope that he would somehow get through. Um, it was very, very hard on her. And it, I, I, I felt that, that terror and that loss myself. You know, I, I included my grandfather in my nightly prayers when I prayed for my parents, and for my grandfather, and for my beautiful country, my beautiful patrie. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to encourage um, folks, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free. You can also unmute yourself. You can write it in the uh, chat Renee, box. Let's get for you. Yes. I'd like to ask you one question about your, your uncle who was in Dachau. How did he get out of Dachau? They just let him out? Uh, they did not. Well, this, uh, this is 1938, you know, okay, right so, after Kristallnacht. Okay. And um, uh, at that point, the Germans were just really f trying to find any way to get rid of the Jews. Okay. And uh, if you get, get them to go to Palestine or to the United States or anywhere, they were only too happy to let you go. And uh, he had his papers, he had the affidavit and his visa. And uh, he had a way of getting to the United States, which he did. When did you get to America? When did you get? Well, you know, after Switzerland, you know, we were in Switzerland till the end of the war and we came back to our country, to France, um, which being Lorraine was, you know, in dreadful, dreadful shape at that point, you know, having, having been the path of General Patton, you know, to Germany, um, everything was demolished, obliterated and damaged. Our home had been robbed of everything that was in it. Uh, uh, we didn't even have a place to stay. It was very, very hard. Uh, we stayed, but despite that, you know, my father started a new business um, and uh, we stayed in France until 1947. And um, I was at the lycée, uh, finished my première partie du baccalauréat. I would have gladly stayed in France. I still loved France. I, um, I had my friends. I, I was back in school in the language I loved, studying you know, the literature I loved, the history I loved. Uh, I, of course, by that time I had started to study English. I do have to say that. Um, I didn't want to leave, but the second Passover in April of 1947, when by that time we, it, become, it had become evident beyond any doubt that we were the only survivors left in Europe who had not either gone to Brazil or to the United States. Everyone else had had not survived. We had been living on the illusion, on the hope that somehow, somewhere out of the displaced persons camps, et cetera, et cetera, somebody would come back who had survived, but nobody had. At this point, it was my little sister who said, no, why, would, why can't we have family like other people do? Mm -hmm. And in, 1940, in July of 1947, we came to the United States. 
having to start school in yet a third language. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It was beautiful listening to you. So eloquent. Thank you, Renee. Thank you. And, and Renee, I just want to say that you, you were speaking about one of your favorite people in the world. That was my father, one of my favorite people in this world. So I'm happy he was able to, to join us. Um, also, another person joining us, uh, one of your former French students, high school French students, is an attendee here and, and says hello and wanted to Who is that? share that she's here with you. Um, uh, Tina uh, is here. Yeah. Oh, hello, and, Tina. And, um, hello, Madame. And uh, we also have another question and your answers make me want to ask more questions, but first I'm going to um, ask this one uh, for Jill. Um, why did your paternal grandmother separate from your family early on? Well, she did not separate in Lyon. We separated in Toulouse on the railroad, on the station of Toulouse, because in Toulouse, it became evident, you know, that we were going in two different directions. We were going to be traveling uh, east and north, and my grandmother was going to have to travel due south to Marseille to uh, catch uh, some form of uh, travel to get her to, Ma to the United States with the two cousins. Oh, and incidentally, they did make it. They found a way, you know, in Marseille, thanks to, you know, my, my cousin Leon, who by that time was 13, 14, um, who was a whirlwind of making connections and getting things done. Uh, you know, he learned languages in no time at all. He, um, if, I think he was able to contact uh, a, members of a you know of other refugee communities, uh, um, and from other parts of Europe, uh, uh, and um, eventually they made their way uh, back through across the Pyrenees into Spain and uh, to Portugal, and they caught a cattle ship in Lisbon that took them to the United States. The three of them. And, uh, you know, that was indeed, the, my father saw his mother the last time on that platform in Toulouse. Uh, we did not, you know, by the time we did come to the United States in 1947, my grandmother had passed away. Thank you, Renee, for that. Um, uh, we did have a lot of um, statements in addition to questions that people are just saying, thank you so much for sharing this with us. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that you were getting a lot of comments from people just well, saying thank you, thank you and, and for sharing, for keeping this alive. Um, so, uh, Oh, so I'm going to hopefully be able to ask four more questions, if that's okay. And if we if we're running low on time, Thorne will let me know. But we have another question. Um, um, someone mentioned that you wrote a book about this. Asked that I should um, ask you uh, about this book, how you came to to write it, and what was, what that was like. Well, what happened with this book? Uh, a, a a lady called Connie Steiner, who at the time lived in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Uh, who was a writer of children's books, was writing a book called The Shoes for Amelie's, uh, which apparently was about a little boy uh, you know, who was trying to make shoes for a little girl who was in the same boat I was in when I was hidden in Le Chambon and was about the same age. And, uh, you know, it was a fantasy in to some extent, but when she asked around for for details, somebody gave me her, gave her my name to contact. And in the course of uh, speaking with me to get information for this book, she, you know, when she was finished with it, she asked, would she, would I allow her to write a book about my life's, you know, my experiences is specifically. Uh, Connie is a, she was a delightful, you know, illustrator, a delightful you know, writer, but uh, I think she in some ways was from another century. You know, she would have me on the telephone for hours at a time. And 
maybe six weeks later, I would get three handwritten pages, which I would then correct and send back to her. And six weeks later, if I was lucky, I would get these pages back typewritten. And make a long story short, after 14 years of doing this, mind you, I, um, my little sister had passed away. My husband had passed away. I was getting on in years and I said, you know something, all this effort is being put in this book. I, I'd like to see it finished before I go. And I contacted Connie and I said to her, would you mind if I finished the book and uh, paid for having it published? Because you know she was having some difficulty finding people who were interested in publishing it. So, uh, I had I had the name of someone who was willing to publish it at my cost. And Connie said, sure, go ahead. So I finished the book. Um, you know, we I wrote an epilogue, which filled in a lot of the history, which was not totally evident in the writing in the book. And um, uh, the book was published. Um, and, uh, you know, I I've shared it with a lot of particularly young people. Oh, for a while I had it on Amazon, but it's, it's such a um, chore to get them to Amazon and for people to get it, you know, for me to get it to Amazon after, and, and then at one point, uh, somebody thought they needed a whole slew of them and I didn't want to give the remaining ones to Amazon. Um, and meanwhile, that fell through. So the only ones that are left are the ones that are in my basement. <laughs> and uh, I, can, I can make them, as I've said to Avi and uh, Emily, I brought some to the center. If anybody wants to you know, sell them for a contribution to the uh, center in Glen Cove, uh, I will be very happy to donate any, of, any that I have left. Beautiful, thank you. Um... I do have another question based on uh, your book, but I'll, I'll ask these three. Hopefully, we'll we'll try to wrap up by three o'clock. But I think we can all go on listening to you because uh, it's an incredible uh, testimony. So I hope we can uh, share that book. Um, so my two questions, and then shortly after, I'll ask her the, the final one. So number one, um, you said that your mother uh, had to hold all of this inside she wasn't able to tell the other adult in her life your father you know her experiences you were 11 years old when you uh, left your place of hiding went to your sister who was nine years old and took her to your your family's home and held all of this in you didn't want to tell her can you share what that experience was like for you an 11 year old child well, uh, yeah, I'll tell you, first of all, I would say <clears throat> that that first moment when I knocked on my parents' door or rang the bell and there was no answer, if I have to say that in my entire life, there was one moment that was worse than any other, that was that second, you know, that moment. And um, I really, I at the time, did not think about the immense, you know, actual irresponsibility I had taken, you know, taking making this decision in a, a time of war in a country that where obviously was not wanted, where all of us were in danger, that I hadn't thought it through. Um, you know, it, it was a actually I did develop an, a, a nervous tick which stayed with me for quite a while. Um, which began when Monsieur Fournier first told me this, you know, don't expect to find your parents, and et cetera, et cetera. And Madame Fournier actually detected it. It was so obvious. And my mother immediately detected it. Uh, um, I eventually got rid of it, but it was totally involuntary. It, and it was a result, I think, I know, of this, what must have gone on in, in my nervous system. You know. uh, it wasn't until very much later. And actually, I, I have to add, you know, I was not aware of the role 
that the people of Le Chambon as a whole played because my sister and I were truly hidden. I only met the Fourniers and the family where my sister was hidden and the second family, the Mesdemoiselles Royer, where I was hidden uh, the second time. And between the humiliation uh, I had suffered uh, at the hands of Madame la Directrice and you know, at a time when children were brought up to respect their elders, to respect their teachers, and to absolutely, absolutely venerate the principal of a school. You know, um, I had a, 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 almost a sense of guilt about the whole experience. And until I saw quite unexpectedly a film called Weapons of the Spirit with my husband, who really didn't know any of this, because I kind of kept it pent up. Uh, I had really repressed the entire experience. It was not only humiliating, yeah, but for some reason I felt almost shame about it. And it wasn't until I saw Weapons of the Spirit, a film made by Pierre Sauvage about Le Chambon sur Lignon, and where he flashes on the screen Madame Dreyfus's notebooks in which uh, he interviews her. And he says, I understand you have these notebooks. And she says, yes, I'm embarrassed to admit. I am ashamed to admit, ashamed because if anybody had found these notebooks, uh, it would have been the end of many people's lives. In these notebooks, she had the list of the children she was taking from Lyon and from uh, Saint Etienne to Le Chambon, and she had their home address, and she had their birthdays, and she had the names of the farmers where she was taking them. And she goes through this little notebook, and God Almighty, I see my sister's name and her address and her date of birth. And then she goes further, and I see mine and the family where I was being taken. Um, this happened actually in the presence of my husband at a synagogue in a Great Neck. And I let out a scream, as I have never screamed in my entire life and hope never will, because it, it was making a realization that I had been a part of something really magnificent. You know, the act of the people of Le Chambon was so, so unique. And, um, you know, I, I owed my life to them. My little sister owed her life to them. Oh, thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just ask one more question, but I do want to just share some of these uh, comments again. So, uh, Someone said that this is an outstanding odyssey that you're sharing with us, Renee. Thanks so much for doing so. Another person said, what an incredible example of survival. Thank you so much for sharing your amazing story. Um, uh, thank you for sharing your amazingly detailed and moving story with us. Um, so I just wanted to share those with you. Um, and um, I'll sort of piggyback these two together. So um, Gregory, um, uh, a, a cousin of yours says, I'm uh, struck by your curiosity and strength um, in your tone as you describe um, in detail, and yet there's no anger against the Nazis or sorrow for your terrible losses. Um, so the question that's asked also is, is there a secret you can share that keeps you in this sense? And then another question based on the title of your book, the title is, and yet I still loved France. So the second question, these are the two last ones that will tie together. With all that you and your family experienced in France, where is this love? How do you still love this country? So I guess uh, those two things, that spirit and love, you can answer My together. family's experience, my, my personal and my family's experience. And, you know, the, the dreadful portions of it were at the hands of the French. The French doing their best to become, you know, the friends of the Germans. Uh, my immediate experience, you know, Gurs, 
Lyon, Le Chambon, a flight to Switzerland was not because of the Germans. It was because of the French, because of Vichy France. Vichy France um, did my family more harm, my immediate family more harm than the Germans. Um, I will add one other thing. I've gone back to both France and Germany and I couldn't believe the first few times I was in France not to find a single museum or acknowledgement of any sort of their part in the persecution of the Jews. You know, when uh, uh, I'm sure many of you have read uh, uh, Sarah's Key, which is based on a true story, the, the story of the Velodrome d'Hiver. It was the French who did this completely inhuman thing. That's one thing. Uh, as for, you know, and, and, I, and I just saw, I saw a lot about the resistance, about the Maquis, but I never saw anything about the French role in uh, uh, deporting the, the, the Jews of France. The French actually had a refinement in, the, in their deportation. Um, they decided that to deport the parents with the children uh, was not, was inhumane. They, instead, they deported the parents, they separated the parents and the children right on the platform of the train. And I have, I have copies of lists of convoys of, you know, particularly mothers and their children, the names of the children, their ages, and the mothers were separated from the children. That was a refinement the French invented. Very few people know about. The other thing I will say, contrary to not having any sort of um, acknowledgement uh, or teaching about the uh, what happened to in the Holocaust. I was in Berlin with my husband, who was an architect, and we went to Daniel Liebeskind's uh, museum, the Jewish Museum in Berlin. The experience of being in the museum was the most emotional architectural thing I have ever had because of the way the, the building was developed and constructed. It was extraordinary. But even more extraordinary was after we finished visiting the museum, we were in the library and in the archive section, which was absolutely filled with young high school and college students, German high school and college students, studying, learning about the Holocaust. And then right next to the Brandenburg uh, gates, uh, they built this memorial, uh, you know, the style is uh, to the Holocaust. And throughout Berlin, I didn't see it because that happened later on. They have what, what they called the Stolpersteine in front of the houses where German Jews, Berliner Jews used to live. They have brass plaques with the name of the person and you know what happened to them. You, you can hardly say they take full, they take full blame. You know, I don't want to say credit, but they don't try to ignore their guilt as the French do. But you know, as I started, you know, France is still a beautiful, beautiful country. And yes, yet I still love France. Renee, I'm going to, to end our program now. And I wanna thank you for sharing, first of all, for drawing our attention to this history that as you say is often uh, under told and also for sharing your story, which makes it so much more personal and share something of the amazing experience that you went through and really thank you for sharing that. Michael, thank you also for hosting our program and for, for taking the questions and, and for being, uh, for helping to arrange this whole thing. So thank you, Michael. 
everybody who's joined us, I appreciate you joining us and thank you for spending some of your Sunday with us. And I hope that you will join us for some of our other upcoming programs, including one, as I said, by the new book about, about Vichy France uh, okay. and about when France fell that we're gonna be having uh, next week. So uh, thank you everybody and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Grateful to you all. Thank you, Renee. Thank Bye -bye. you, Joanne.